Well, good morning. I get to talk about one of the best things, and that is plants. The one we think of, oh, De Ohio Department of Transportation in scenic Ohio. It's really the plant material that helps make Ohio scenic. So often we look at sites that look like this. And what makes one site successful and another site unsuccessful? A lot of it goes into the planning and the realization of what might be going on. I mean, in this case, it was irrigation or near no irrigation. You know, planning is important, not just the plants. A lot of what we do is affected by what is around us and the conditions that uh, we are faced with along our highways. And soil-borne salt and compacted soils are two of the biggest concerns that I see uh, as a nurseryman uh, that supplies plants for different projects, uh, uh, whether they be uh, a residential, commercial, or uh, a highway project is, you know, what are, what are the effects that go in, uh, that affect the plants? And that goes into plant selection. And in your handout, you will have a list of some of those plants that have salt tolerance and also are tolerant of compacted soils. Uh, hopefully that would help you in when you're thinking about what to use or what might be involved out there. But we know that salt, it's a, it's a necessary evil. Uh, we need it, but it's how we use salt that we can you know, end up with problems like this. The salt uh, handout that I has provided to you is uh, I put together a few years back and these are some of the resources that I had used in putting that list together. When we talk about salt, when we think about salt, how it does damage to plants, you got to consider wind direction. And it makes a difference with our highways, especially, uh, as to where, where the wind comes from. It generally comes from the west and southwest. So it's the east side of the road that's going to get the most damage, and the safest side of the road for planting is going to be the west side. Speed of traffic can make a difference. The faster the speed, the more salt that's put up in the aerial drift. Damage increases as traffic increases. Injury can be more severe on the side facing the, whole, the highway, and you're going to see pictures of that. And of course, at intersections and, or at the base of a hill, this is where we use more salt. Inju injury decreases with the distance from the highway, which makes sense. But I'll show you an interesting picture even on that. And of course, poorly drained soils, where does the salt go? It's going to go to the, the sinks, and that's where you're going to get more soil-borne salt. And these are going to be the problem in areas where more injury can, uh, can take place. And then this time of year, where do we see the injury first? It's going to be on the conifers because they have their foliage. The deciduous plants, you're not going to see it until they come into leaf or don't. And of course, damage can be cumulative because we do this year after year. We take a look at a planting like this, and this is, uh, this is plant selection. That's white pine. White pine is not a tolerant plant of salt. And uh, it's going to be one of those that is qu most quickly damaged when it comes to uh, evergreens along a highway. And again, placement on the west side of a road uh, very likely you could get away with it and not have damage. On the east side, you're going to end up with plantings that look like this. And this is what I mean about deciduous material. Uh, we're not going to see this kind of damage until the leaves try to come out. And you get that witch's broom effect because the salt uh, on plants that are not tolerant of salt uh, lose their, their uh, apical buds, and then you get this witch's broom effect on the trees. And then you know, the rate of salt. Uh, do, when do we put too much? Is this near a, uh, an intersection? We see this kind of damage where you can see where the salt is hitting that tree, where they're green above and brown below. And here, uh, pretty obvious. I don't think anybody slipped on that sidewalk because you can see there's, there's uh, no grass uh, on the left side 
and you can see where the salt, uh, when they were going along with the spreader, how they hit the ewes on the right. This is an interesting landscape. This is on I-271 up near Harvard uh, Road, uh, if you know that intersection up there. And um, the reason I know this building is because I had rotator cuff surgery and I had to go to see my surgeon uh, visit him. And I passed that pair every time I went in. And if you look at it, that's, that's salt damage at the top of that tree. What's interesting, that semi, there's 271. There's an access road between 271 and the building parking lot. We're easily 500 feet from 271 on the east side, and that is salt damage from 271. So, you know, when we say 60 feet, yeah, but there's rate, the rate of uh, speed. It's an open area with wind, high traffic, and salt uh, at least 500 feet away from the highway causing damage to some of the plants and yet not to others. Tree lilacs were used on the access road, uh, getting heavy salt, no problem whatsoever. <coughs> Same thing with honey locust, plant selection. This is Pearl Road in Strongsville. Uh, traffic speed is about 35 miles per hour. This is the east side of the street. Those are pear. If you look, the trees are alive and they're gonna leaf out. But on the highway side, the east side of the road, no blooms, the, bloods, the buds are gone from salt. On the inside of the parking lot, if I had to photograph them from that side, you wouldn't even know there was damage to the trees. So salt is a very serious problem along our highways, yet we have to do it, that necessary evil. Plant selection, and just to, uh, I'm going to just review a few of the plants that are on the handout that I've given you. And one of them is catalpa. And I've chosen many of the plants I'm talking about today are some of the native plants because there is a movement and a conscious effort to use more native plant material, not only along our highways, but in so many landscapes. And catalpa is one of those old trees that can be found around old uh, homesteads and farmsteads around the state uh, that can take salt, both uh, soil-borne, wind-driven, and heavy compacted soils. So a very adaptable tree along highways. It is a big tree, so again, size is important. Setback, so that you're not uh, you're worrying about this as a tree that has to be taken down within a highway right-of-way. So you'd want to use something like this back set. But large leaves, the, uh, the seed pods, which are so distinctive, we used to, as kids, we used to call them lady cigars. And of course, the flowers that when you look at them close up are almost like tiny orchids and very, very beautiful. Another tree that is native more to central and southern Ohio is hackberry. Uh, this is a tree that is a good prairie tree. And if you think about our highway systems, aren't they really prairies out there? Uh, they're, they're very cold in winter, very hot in summer, very dry. And we need tough trees that can take that situation and celtus or hackberry is one of those trees. Again, one that'll take that uh, tough soil site and uh, salt. And persimmon. Persimmon native down along the Ohio River and into West Virginia, but an interesting tree that, uh, especially maybe near uh, a rest area, uh, very distinctive bark. An interesting small flower that you really don't see, but an edible fruit on a tree that uh, uh, is uh, a very attractive landscape plant and, uh, and yet can take the salt, both wind-driven and soil-borne. And honey locusts. Honey locusts is one of those solution plants. When in doubt, we use a honey locust. Sometimes we overuse them. But why do we overuse them? Because they're successful. They work. This is another one that was along 271 and not disturbed by all that heavy salt that was killing that pear. And gymnoclatus. Gymnoclatus is Kentucky coffee tree. And it's interesting that up until a few years ago, the state champion uh, coffee tree was just a few miles down the road from me on the Perry-Madison border up in Lake County. And uh, this is a tree again that can take wind-driven salt, soil-borne salt, compacted soils. It's tough, resilient, a large grower, so again, back set from the highway. 
very, very distinctive coarse texture and bark. And leaves, very small leaves, which if you're in a maintenance area, uh, the leaf itself is the entire area here. It's a bipinnately compound leaf, but the little leaflets, uh, like honey locust, very little to clean up if litter is a problem around a rest area. One of my favorites, Nyssa. Nyssa sylvatica is tupelo. Uh, this is a plant that you would find on a floodplain. Uh, very, very adaptable, uh, deep-rooted plant that is going to take uh, a compacted wet soil, but surprisingly is also quite adaptable to the, the, the rigors of salt. Selection. On the left, you can see a tree that I found as a seedling uh, from seed that I collected along one of my farms and <clears throat> just recently introduced. Uh, the common name of uh, Nyssa, uh, one of the names is Tupelo. And this one being an upright plant, I named it Tupelo Tower. And you can see the distinctive form by comparison to the broad ranging, uh, wide spreading branches of the species. The, the fall foliage color is very effective from scarlet to orange. In the case of Tupelo Tower, it's more orange. And they can fruit. The fruits are tiny, they're not messy, and are attractive to wildlife, especially the birds. Another one of those solution plants that we tend to maybe overuse sometimes, but why do we use to overuse them? Because they work, and that's the plane trees. The London plane is uh, one of those tough trees that can take compacted soils. It's adaptable uh, in salt situations. And we also have the native sycamore. It's interesting that some years ago, as, uh, as a nurseryman, I, I wouldn't have considered growing the tree. But with the awareness of natives today, this is a tree that is very, very sought after. In fact, I'm working with Davis Sidner, a now retired uh, uh, professor from Ohio State University, evaluating native sycamores for resistance to anthracnose, which is a leaf disease, more com cosmetic, to find even improved selections of our native tree. And oaks. Oaks are tough, and if we select the correct ones, they are also very adaptable along our highways. Quercus bicolor, like uh, Nyssa, is one of those floodplain plants. Where Nyssa is a very deep-rooted tree, this is a very fibrous-rooted tree, very broad-spreading, one of the easiest oaks to transplant and adaptable to compacted uh, wet sites and to uh, salt. And as you get to the western part of the state, although we can use it here in the east, is bur oak. Uh, it's native up in Lake County area, and it's native here uh, around Akron. But uh, where you find more of it is as you go west in the state and south, because this is a tree that can grow on not only acid soils, as we would assume most oaks do, but this one is very adaptable to alkaline soils. So an extremely adaptable tree for compacted soils and salt tolerance. The acorns are very unique and interesting. For me, uh, in the northeast corner of the state, uh, what I would call a normal size acorn, uh, like a large marble. By the time you uh, find the species in southwest Ohio, between Dayton and Cincinnati, the acorn can be like a small golf ball. It's amazing uh, that plant diversity can be that great in a species and within our own state. And this is tree lilac. Tree lilac is an Asian tree, comes from China, a beautiful flowering tree that flowers in June, small tree that can grow from 25 to 35 feet in height, uh, in height flowering in June. And this is the tree that along 271 had no salt damage whatsoever. And it was uh, probably within 150 feet of 271, getting all that salt and no damage at all. So here's a tree that's not only attractive, but very, very durable. Another species uh, have about the same qualities. This is Peking lilac or Syringa pekinensis. Uh, this one again comes from China where the reticulata comes from China and Japan. Uh, the flower uh, difference is this one blooms about a week off from uh, the, uh, the Japanese tree lilac. Uh, where Japanese tree lilac is uh, more of a cream uh, cluster of flowers, this one is more pure white and slightly smaller. An attractor tree, more often with a rounded habit, can be grown as a single stem 
or multiple stem plant as an ornamental. And elms. I think it's sort of ironic that as we have troubles with emerald ash borer, and that seems, I feel that the ash replaced the elms when Dutch elm disease came, uh, came in. Through work uh, with researchers from the USDA, uh, and it started in, uh, with, with the USDA research in Delaware, Ohio, where Valley Forge was found by Denny Townsend. Uh, Denny was a researcher there back in the 70s, and when they closed that uh, facility, uh, he moved and did his research and uh, introduced this tree uh, uh, out of the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., but it's actually an Ohio tree. Uh, strong and durable, uh, resistant to and tolerant to Dutch elm disease, and I think these would be interesting that now the American elm will uh, be replacing our declining ashes. Uh, it has uh, the form of the traditional elm, the more vase shape. It's going to be a big grower. If you want something that is a little more refined, Princeton is a smaller growing form of American elm uh, that is more of an upright habit. Still vase shape, but not as vase shape and not as open as the traditional uh, American elm of my childhood. I learned to use a chainsaw in the late 50s on dying elms. Grasses. We need plants, short plants, that uh, are very adaptable for massing. These are uh, plants that can be used where salt is a problem because the, uh, though they are very showy in summer, the tops are dead in winter when salt is going to be the biggest uh, issue, uh, especially with wind-driven and even soil salt. So many grasses are adaptable. We have uh, uh, many species that are introduced species, but native species as well that can work. This is uh, Etna, Pennsylvania, uh, Route 8. It's, a, it's a, uh, going up uh, a highway uh, where salt is used over there. They don't use as much. They don't have to. They don't get as much snow as we do up in this part of the country. But they did get a lot of salt. This was on the east side of the highway. Uh, that planting is still there, even though it was put in over 30 years ago. Grasses uh, give longevity in the landscape and value because it is a very, very effective plant and very cost effective as well. In parking areas, where do we pile snow? In the middle of those parking islands. And if uh, with grasses uh, and perennials, these plants are not there in winter. We can easily uh, uh, put the snow there. Uh, again, the salt with the snow. These plants are adaptable. They're going to survive and keep uh, the parking areas along our highways looking beautiful. Bioswales is another area, and Craig and Pat will get into talking about these. But there are so many native grasses and other plants that can be used to make areas like this beautiful and attractive along our highways. Here uh, in the parking lot again, retention basins, uh, bioswales. Where do we put that water? We can put it here and still make it attractive, useful. We can pile the snow, and those plants are going to be there looking good the following spring. Native plants like sedges and palm sedge uh, being one of them. This is Carex muskingamensis, the skingamensis, the skingum river, identified here in Ohio, native plant. You can see why it's called palm sedge just by looking at the plant. Adaptable to these salt uh, uh, basins and it will work in sun and even in shade an example of how you might use it. And showy and interesting seed heads, subtle with that black coloration. And so many of the uh, rushes like Scirpus validus and other species that uh, can be used in these bioswales. Uh, they're native and good naturalized. In, mass in massing, they can be quite attractive in these areas. You wouldn't think about bamboo in Ohio. This is an Ohio native, a native plant. Our former first lady, I have the privilege of working with Hope Tap on the uh, governor's uh, mansion and other projects. And this is Hope visiting uh, the nursery and standing with our native Ohio bamboo. It's native down along the Ohio River into Kentucky. And actually it's the only species really native to the United States from Southern Ohio down to the Gulf of Mexico 
the Atlantic Ocean to the Missouri Basin. And how many of you even knew that we had a native bamboo? And some of the perennials that can be used in these, in these areas, uh, especially the bioswales, like our native asters. And there's many selections and clones of these. Purple dome uh, being a good selection that uh, can be used, especially in uh, parking areas. Uh, otherwise, you can use the species, uh, even seeding it in, in, in seed groupings. But uh, with uh, cultivars, we get consistency of size and color. And where that's important, you use cultivars. Uh, the Eupatoriums or Joe Pie weed, native along our highways, uh, selections uh, like Gateway, more of a uh, adaptable size that again can be used in bioswale areas where salt is a problem. And Monardas, the bee bombs. A lot of talk about pollinators today. And flowers are important for, our, for our pollinators. And native Monardas and their selections uh, can be used along our highways. We got color choices. Shades of whites, pinks, purples, and reds. And some of the shrubs. Winterberry. This is a holly that is deciduous. Uh, the plants are male and female, and the females are the ones that have the fruit. This is a plant that is native, uh, especially in the eastern part of the state. Uh, you get around Hudson and then go towards Twinsburg and, and uh, where you've got the the wetland areas out there in the bogs. This is a plant that needs sunlight. If you're familiar with where the exit uh, Route 5 is on the Ohio Turnpike, uh, when you get off uh, coming from Pennsylvania, uh, from the east heading west, and you, would, you get off at that exit, there is a sink as you come through from the, the turnpike and you come around and it goes down. 40 years ago, Ilex fertisoblata was planted in mass at the basin right there with all the salt for 40 years pouring in, coming off of that, uh, th that uh, turnoff to, to get off the turnpike. That planting is still looking good 40 years after planting. Durability of plants, proper choices, proper planting habits. And beautiful winter effect when you're using plants like this. Some of our native dogwoods, our shrubs, Cornus amomum or silky dogwood, adaptable to salt. And I find this particular species and observing it around the nursery where we have a deer as a problem, that they tend to leave this particular species alone more than some of the other native species. Uh, I find that quite interesting, but silky dogwood is again, one of those plants that can be used along the edge of a bioswale or along the edge of a highway. White flowers in spring, followed by blue fruits in autumn. Another one is Cornus sericea, another one of the red twig dogwoods. This one has white fruits and of course the white flowers and red stems in winter. Selections, this is one called Cardinal, selected up in Minnesota. Uh, this one has more of a coral colored mark and is very, very distinctive and very effective uh, one of the most effective of the red twig dogwoods, uh, especially for viewing at great distance. In mass, that makes a real show. And physocarpus. Today, this plant is seeing a resurgence, especially in uh, uh, landscapes because of purple foliage forms. But the species itself is a native Ohio species. And my first experience with that was some of my early years in this business. Uh, when uh, Mr. Garmhausen was director of ODOT, this was one of the plants, the prime plants that was used for some of those early plantings in the 60s and the early 70s. I got in this, uh, the wholesale uh, nursery business in 68. We were growing this plant. By 1972, money was disappearing, highways, uh, the, the mass plantings weren't being done, and literally this plant disappeared from the industry. And it wasn't until the resurgence of the purple forms that we started growing it again for uh, the, the refined landscapes. But now with the call for natives, once again, this plant is becoming popular. And I can think, I don't know if it's still there, but along Route 77, I can remember for years, there was a planting of physocarpus that would go back to the Garmhausen days. And I think it might still be on that highway today. Viburnums, Viburnum dentatum, 
the arrowwood viburnum, one of our native viburnums, very adaptable, salt tolerant. Viburnum leaf beetle has been a problem. It's come through the state, it's passing through. Again, it's going to become just another insect. I think you'll hear about it. I wouldn't be overly concerned about it in future plantings. Very adaptable plant and one of our toughest native viburnums, uh, again, for highway salt. I've walked this wall and I've thrilled by it. I passed this wall, not quite so thrilling. We deal with this today. A necessary evil? I guess. I'm a plantsman. I don't like it. What can we do? Plantings. We can make those where we have these necessary evils. By adapting vines, we can cover them. We can plant shrubs and trees around them. At least make them part of the landscape instead of sticking out and becoming something of a negative. One of our native vines. I, uh, the uh, Pythonocissus, Virginia creeper, very adaptable, salt tolerant, attached to the walls, and I think one of the best choices for uh, uh, sound barriers. I remember years ago, uh, the district down around Cincinnati, they were buying uh, a thousand plus a year of these. And as I go to Cincinnati on 71, I still see those Virginia creeper uh, that are covering some of the sound barriers down there. This was an interesting use where uh, it could be planted at the top of a wall, same plant allowing it to drape down rather than grow up. Here it is, just carving, uh, at least creating a bit of natural art along a wall. And you can see what it can do in small amounts and then in larger amounts could totally cover the area. Other vines that work, native trumpet vine, campsus, it brings seasonal bloom in summer. And as you travel along, uh, you'll see uh, along the, uh, the fence posts, along our interstates, many of the vines that are crawling up there are this plant because they are salt tolerant, durable, and native, and giving us orange flowers in midsummer. And sumacs. Sumacs uh, are natural plants, and years ago I can remember supplying 10,000 sumac to be planted on I-75 from the Ohio border up to Detroit when uh, I-75 was put in with the MDOT. But this is a plant that can be used in mass along our highway systems and in Akron, uh, this one has been used along with this one, Rus aromatica. Uh, this is the uh, a more dwarf sumac. If you want a more compact plant to about three feet, grow low is uh, that, uh, this can be used in mass. They're tough, they're durable and adaptable to highway salt. A new one on the horizon is Rus copalina, prairie flame. Rus copalina is native to the western part of the state, and this selection was actually selected uh, more from the prairies of Illinois and will be only six feet in height. Again, great as an individual specimen or you very useful in large mass. Green in foliage in summer, and then this beautiful uh, range from oranges to reds in autumn. Successful plantings will make our highways more beautiful, more attractive. 